all very welcome along to the last of our talks here at Skin Side Out uh, 2023 today, and we are exploring psoriasis, a condition that many of you uh, today are probably familiar with, either through direct experience or a family member's um, condition or someone you're caring for. So we're delighted to have the opportunity to have this discussion, uh, to explore the condition more and talk about the, the new treatments available and the advances in treatment um, that many of you will also be, be familiar with. Uh, Professor Brian Kirby is a consultant dermatologist at St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin and a full clinical professor of dermatology and a principal investigator at the Charles Institute of Dermatology at University College Dublin. He has a wealth of published work on the topic of psoriasis and he has devoted a lot of his career to examining uh, the condition. So I'd like to welcome Professor Kirby to the stage uh, to talk to us today. And after his presentation, we will be discussing this topic further with um, the panel that we have here today, so we're excited about that. And also, uh, Professor Kirby will be taking your questions, so anything you wish to raise um, with him, we can do that at the end of this presentation. Thank you, um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Am I transmitting on the microphone? I think I am. Yeah, excellent. Um, this is entitled Psoriasis in 2023, and the reason for that is at the launch of the Irish Skin Foundation 2013. I gave a talk on psoriasis in 2013, and hopefully I'll be around for 2033. So I do a lot of work with psoriasis. It's important to know that I have a lot of disclosures with industry, that we do clinical trials uh, and advise industry and scientific advisory boards. So when I'm talking about moderate to severe psoriasis, for those of you in the audience who have it, or for those of you in the audience who've got a loved one with it, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about milder disease that just affects elbows and maybe bits on the knees. I'm talking about people with more than 10% body surface area affected, very inflamed skin that's itchy, that's sore, and impacts on most of the daily functioning of their lives. And there was a famous quote from John Updike, who's the American novelist who had psoriasis, and he described his daily war with his skin. And he felt that he was like a leper. And um, actually, ironically, a lot of what's described in the lepros in the Bible probably wasn't leprosy, but was actually psoriasis. Leprosy was thought not to exist in Palestine around that time. And um, Jesus may have cured the lepers, but unfortunately, he wasn't curing psoriasis. Or I wish he had. But you can see from this photograph, which is a little bit blurred, but this is itchy, this is sore, this is uncomfortable. And this impacts on pretty much everything that you do, how you work, what your relationships are, how often you're going to take time in your day to look after skin, what you wear, whether you do sport, what your hobbies are, whether you go on holidays, do you go to the swimming pool? Most people with psoriasis like this don't interact uh, in, in these ways. And our aim is to make people better so they do live normal lives. But also this level of psoriasis also has impacts on your general health, and we'll be discussing with Dr. Carl or one of my colleagues um, with regards to the impact when it affects the joints, but it can also affect mood, it can also affect cardiovascular disease and other autoimmune diseases, because psoriasis is one of these, can also be commoner in people with moderate to severe disease. So this is, again, just a nice example of uh, what psoriasis looks like, and Part of what I would say to people in the audience is when you get this extent of psoriasis, because unfortunately in a lot of medical hierarchies, and in particular people who don't know a lot about skin disease, they feel that this is just about putting cream on this. You're not going to get people with this sort of skin disease better with just cream. And also at this level, this is a systemic inflammatory disease that needs stronger treatment than just creams or ointments. But then we see some milder forms, and the classic forms of psoriasis you can see here on the scalp, the knees, the elbows, and we know it's psoriasis because it goes from completely normal skin to completely abnormal skin in a very sharp cutoff. It's well demarcated. It's scaly, and as I said before, is often itchy and sore. And there are various subsets of this that can affect the soles of the feet, so these are all little pustules under the skin, and people with this will tell you this is like walking on shards of glass. So if life isn't uncomfortable enough for you, you want to try walking around on shards of glass all the time. About 50% of patients will have nail disease, 
and I put this picture in specifically because we'll be talking about psoriatic arthritis, and one third of patients with moderate to severe psoriasis will develop psoriatic arthritis in their lifetimes, and our job is to try and find that earlier so that it's treated appropriately. Oh, sorry, go back. Rarely, and I'm glad to say this is rare, psoriasis can become life-threatening in the short term. So if this is a gentleman whose all of his skin looks like this, and this is called generalized posture psoriasis, unfortunately this is rare, but part of the functions of our skin are to keep us in so that we don't dehydrate, we don't lose too much water and fluid from our skin, and to keep bugs out. And when this happens to your skin, the skin barrier fails. And unfortunately, people like this are at risk of serious infections and can die. Now, fortunately, this is rare, and in Ireland in 2023, most patients, even if they develop this, won't become seriously unwell. But it is one of the consequences of poorly controlled psoriasis if it's not dealt with properly but albeit rare, so I'm not here to frighten people. So what is happening in the skin? So for anybody, if you hope you, some of you have an idea of some biology, but maybe not, keratinocyte is the top layer of the skin. That's the bit that flakes off every month. So about once every 30, 35 days, our skin starts at the bottom, rises to the top, and flakes off. Without any help from exfoliators, it does that quite naturally. And we have immune systems in our skin. We're more familiar with immune systems now because of COVID. And immune systems in our skin are designed to fight infection. But in psoriasis, these immune systems are overactive. And they produce cells called Th1 cells and Th17 cells. These are called T cells. For short, that make this top layer of the skin overactive. So the skin becomes thicker. It becomes itchy, it becomes sore, and it produces more of these keratinocytes and turns over quicker, and that's what we see as scale. So in psoriasis, the skin is turning over every four to four and a half days, somewhere between eight, seven and eight times quicker than normal. So often patients will come along and say, well, my immune system is, is upset. I've read about, a bit about this online, and my immune system is low. Actually, in psoriasis, the immune system is overactive. And a lot of our modern treatments are targeting specific immune targets in the skin to try and stop this process and reset it towards normal. But we also know that severe psoriasis is associated with inflammation in the blood vessels and generalized inflammation. And this can be associated with certain medical conditions. And the medical term for this is comorbidities, which is a bit of an ugly phrase and a bit of a a mouthful, but there are certain medical conditions that will be influenced by systemic inflammation. So inflammation is too much activity of the immune system in the blood, and these comorbidities can make the inflammation worse, or the inflammation can result in these comorbidities. But a simple way of understanding comorbidities are other diseases that are associated with moderate to severe psoriasis. And we know that psoriasis is due to overactive immune system in the skin. Some of this is due to genetic factors, and some of this is due to environmental factors, and we'll touch on these now. So the associated diseases, psoriatic arthritis, and we have a, a, an expert rheumatologist here to discuss this later. Patients who are overweight, so if their BMI is in the greater than 30 weight group, are more likely to have changes in the immune system that coincides with psoriasis. So as we gain weight, our immune system changes, and that's more likely to make psoriasis worse. And there's being overweight, and then there's a constellation of symptoms called metabolic syndrome. So this is particularly bad for your heart and for the risk of stroke. So if you are overweight, if you've got high blood pressure, if you've got abnormal sugar metabolism, including diabetes, you've got abnormal cholesterol, you may have metabolic syndrome. And this increases your risk of cardiovascular disease and strokes. And part of our job in people with moderate to severe psoriasis is to detect this earlier so that we can manage these and normalize these cardiovascular risks, which we've mentioned here. People with more severe psoriasis are also more likely to be depressed, more likely to have issues with excess alcohol, and we think that it's the psoriasis that pushes this, 
and other immune-mediated diseases such as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which are part of the gut and the immune system being overactive in the gut, and uveitis, which is a, an eye condition. Sounds depressing, doesn't it, really? But most of these things now in 2023 can be managed so that we can get people with psoriasis living normal lives and reduce their risk of getting cardiovascular disease and manage arthritis and the psychological disease better. So this is what psoriatic arthritis looks like. This is a picture from uh, Oliver Sterled, who was a rheumatologist at St. Vincent's, recently retired. But it can affect the joints. You can see this joint here is quite swollen. You imagine it's quite sore. About 50% of people, or 50% of people with psoriatic arthritis have got nail disease. This can be as mild as pits, but the nails can be quite thickened scaly and crusty. It can infect the back, where you get inflammation of the sacroiliac joints and of the, the neck joints, and you get destruction of the bone, and then excessive bone formation in other areas that make the joints sore and painful, and if untreated, can cause lack of function. Again, this is less common now with modern treatments. But anything up to 30% of patients with moderate to severe psoriasis will develop psoriatic arthritis. And this is again a study that we published with Oliver Fitzgerald probably about 10 years ago now. And the arthritis can occur within a year of getting skin disease in about a quarter of patients. So they may get the joint disease first and then the skin disease or the skin disease and the joint disease, but within one year. But about another quarter of patients, it's between one and seven years afterwards about an eighth or nearly 14%, eight to 11 years, and nearly one third more than 11 years. So part of our job as dermatologists when we're treating people with psoriasis is to try and detect arthritis earlier, even though they may have had the skin disease for some time before the arthritis comes along. This isn't an exact science, however. So when we screen for psoriatic arthritis, and this should happen at least once a year in a psoriasis clinic, and more often if patients have joint pain, but we do need dermatologists are great to ask about skin, but not necessarily about joints. Do they have inflammatory back pain? And inflammatory back pain is if you wake up in the morning and your back is stiff and it takes two minutes, five minutes, or even some people take half an hour before they get going and the inflammation reduces. People often notice it if they've been sitting in one place, like some of you have for this afternoon, or if you've had a long car journey that the back is stiff, it takes a while to get going, and that's inflammation and back pain. Wear and tear back pain tends to be something that happens at the end of the day, if you've been walking a lot or if you're out gardening or playing golf. And we use questionnaires to try and distinguish between what's ordinary wear and tear arthritis or just pains and psoriatic arthritis, and then we refer appropriately um, to our rheumatology colleagues to see if patients have got psoriatic arthritis. So I touched on the fact that this part of this is genetic. And there was great excitement. We've known that with twin studies that there's probably a gene involved. So identical twins have the exact same genes. We have twins in our family, boy-girl twins, and often they're asked, are you identical? Which causes them to smile now. It used to make them annoyed when they're earlier. But identical twins have to clearly have to be the same sex because they have exactly the same genes. So if my identical twin gets psoriasis, there's a nearly three quarters chance that I'll get it at some stage in my lifetime. But if I have a non-identical twin, like the twins in our house, that rate goes down to about 20 to 23 percent, or maybe anything as high as one in three. So if there's a discordance or a disagreement between identical twins and non-identical twins, it strongly suggests that there's a gene involved or multiple genes involved in this disease. And when I started working as a registrar in Hume Street many years ago, uh, in the sort of mid-90s, there was great hope from studies like this that we could find a gene for psoriasis. And that would tell us what was wrong, and if we corrected that gene, then everything would be good. We'd have a cure for this disease. Problem is, it's a lot more complicated by this. And a few billion dollars later, we know there are lots of genes involved in psoriasis the majority of which are to do with the immune system and very little to do with the skin. 
And in fact, when last looked at, there are about 35 to 40, and actually this slide is a bit out of date, there are probably around 60 genes that contribute to your risk of getting psoriasis. And the vast majority of these look at how the immune system in the skin is coded. Imagine this is a computer program. We were born with a computer program in our genes that say how our skin is going to react, how the immune system in the skin is going to behave itself. We need an immune system in the skin to deal with infections. We don't have our immune system working in the skin. Unfortunately, we get really ill and die quickly because of infections. And in psoriasis, all of these immune genes are upregulated. We're producing too much immunity in the skin. The advantage of that is people with psoriasis are less likely to actually get skin infections. But in 2023 in Ireland, skin infections aren't a big problem for our general health. If you were to go back 100 years where we lived in less sanitized conditions, there were no antibiotics, skin infections were a common cause of chronic illness. People were ill for many years with skin infections before they cleared. And a simple cut or a simple fall on the street could actually give, lead to a life-threatening infection before antibiotics. So our genes take many generations to change. Our social circumstances don't. So the advantage if you've got psoriasis is you're less likely to die from a skin infection. But in 2023 in Ireland, that's a very low risk. We also know that psoriasis affects how people live their lives, as we touched upon. So this comes from a UK and Irish study we were involved in maybe about seven or eight years ago. Up to one in five people who attend our psoriasis clinic in St. Vincent's need to take antidepressant medication because of a diagnosis of depression. That's a lot higher than the background population. Somewhere around 5 to 8% in Ireland require that normally. Up to one third of patients in a study we did over 10 years ago use alcohol as a stress reliever. But the problem with alcohol and psoriasis is that it seems to make the disease worse. And we recommend that people who do have moderate to severe disease drink the healthy limits of alcohol or even try periods of abstinence. But it's quite an understandable association. In the UK, up to 26 work days a month are lost because of moderate to severe psoriasis. And understandably, people feel humiliated. About 85%, like John Updike, get annoyed with their disease and about one in 10 contemplate suicide. And I think the good news about that is that, if there is good news in that, is that the suicide rates, certainly in Scandinavia, since modern treatments have come in, are the same as the background population. And we would hope if we were to do this study in 2023, that we would see a reduction in all of these, now that skin treatment has got significant better, significantly better. But we know that stress changes how the immune system works. If you're under chronic stress, you produce different hormones and different parts of your immune system than if you're not under chronic stress. And if you're under chronic stress, those changes in the immune system correspond with the bit that makes your psoriasis worse. They happen to fit nicely into this. So when you get more stressed, and we all have stresses in our lives, unfortunately, in about 80% of people, it can make the psoriasis worse. But then psoriasis itself causes stress. And you can envisage a vicious cycle in people with poorly controlled skin disease where their psoriasis is getting worse because they're stressed about their general life. They're then stressed about their psoriasis, which makes their psoriasis worse again and increases the stress. And proper treatment does alleviate that sort of stress that's caused by the disease. It doesn't make everybody happier, but at least takes psoriasis out of their lives. And we also know that these stresses are commoner in people who are younger, particularly in the 18 to 34 year age, age group. People who are older, and I'm hitting for that age bracket now, are more sanguine, we're wiser. We're less worried about our appearance, I suspect, but also formative years, when you're gonna be socializing, when you're gonna be forming relationships. If you've got a lot of psoriasis, like the people I've showed you the photographs earlier, this is gonna have a significant impact, both on your mood and how you live your life. And we know that some things, we've been working on this for a long time, can help to regulate the immune system. And the thing we found that works is mindfulness meditation. And um, Dr. Wilkinson was talking earlier about evidence, and we are all about evidence base. If you go on Google for psoriasis, you'll find cures from everything. There's fish that swim in, in tanks in Bulgaria. 
Um, there's, I'm quoted on a homeopathy website uh, as, um, I think it's vinegar, what's the apple cider vinegar can cure psoriasis. All the evidence is these make no difference. And usually, as Catherine Wilkinson pointed out earlier, there's somebody trying to sell you something. So if you go on this diet, your psoriasis will get better. Three people saying, I went on this diet, my psoriasis got better. Oh, guess what? You have to buy a book. And the book will tell you how to do your diet and how to make you, uh, your skin better. It doesn't work. But we do know that if people who do regularly mindfulness meditation, if stress is the trigger for your psoriasis, have less flares of psoriasis. It doesn't make it all go away, but have less flares of psoriasis, have less problems with depression, and less problems with anxiety. It's cheap, it's easy, and it doesn't have any problems with it, and it has some evidence behind it. They should be the mantras for whenever you're looking at a treatment. Is it cheap, is it easy, is somebody trying to scam me out of money, and does it work? And one of the things is that self-compassion, because a lot of people with psoriasis hate their skin, they start to like their skin and being in their skin after doing this. This chap, when I took this photograph over 20 years ago now, unfortunately, unfortunately that was over 20 years ago, I was doing photographs, I was trying to work out how you'd calculate the severity of this guy's psoriasis, but the bit I didn't look at was that he's pretty overweight, and he had a pretty sedentary lifestyle, smoked a lot, hypertensive, and drank an awful lot. This was in northern England. And we know that the bits of the immune system that are overactive in the skin also contribute to early coronary artery diseases. There's a lot of inflammation in the blood vessels and coronary arteries. If you have coronary artery disease, and this may be related to some of the inflammation in the skin. And this is called PET scanning. So on the left is somebody who doesn't have psoriasis, and this lights up at sites of inflammation. So you can see the skin lights up in some areas, the joints in this man who's sciatic arthritis, but the most impressive bits, these are the big blood vessels leading up to his skin. They're inflamed as well. So if you've moderate to severe psoriasis, there's evidence to say that the blood vessels are getting damaged. And we also have good evidence now, 10 years later, that if you get appropriate treatment and you modify your cardiovascular risk factors, stop smoking, get your cholesterol sorted out, get your blood pressure sorted out, get your skin sorted out, then may we, we, may well reduce, we will reduce this inflammation and may well reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. But we do know that the risk of early myocardial infarction is higher in people with psoriasis, and it's about four to five years earlier. So if my twin brother has got psoriasis and I don't, and we lead the same lives, he will get his heart attack four to five years earlier than I will. But we can modify these if we treat people appropriately. And we think that this is related to the systemic inflammation I was talking about, or inflammation in our blood vessels, leading to earlier heart attack. So psoriasis is not just about skin. It's about looking at the patient as an individual and trying to sort out the associated problems that come with this. So we screen people for diabetes so we can treat earlier. We screen people for blood pressure and cholesterol and try and treat these. We are big on smoking cessation. Smoking does awful things to your immune system and awful things to cardiovascular disease. If you're drinking too much, it needs to be looked into. There are people who have problems with alcohol and can't give up alcohol on their own and we do screen for mood to see if we can sort these out as well. But in my experience, treating the skin in people with severe disease can often improve depression. So how do we treat the skin? So this is my take on this. Um, if your BSA, body surface area, is less than 5%, and that's five, the palm of your hand is 1% of your body surface. So if you've got less than 5%, we tend to use topical treatments. Nowadays, this is vitamin D analogs. I took this from 10 years ago, and I said I'd leave it there. We can't get tar anymore, or we can find it extremely difficult, and ditanol has gone off the market because they were too difficult to use. Um, there are some people who did really well with these, but they're messy and they're troublesome. Topical steroids are all the rage and probably okay to use in less than 5% body surface area. Keeping the skin moisturized reduces itch, and for mild, to moderate potency steroids for the face, flexures, groin area, under the arms. That's quite a reasonable thing to do, but it needs to work. You need to show that it works, and if it doesn't work, then you need to consider whether something else should be done. When you've got more than 10% body surface area, we've got a list of drugs, which I'll go through now and briefly, um, outlining how well 
that we can make these better. But it is a severe it's systemic inflammatory disease. There's an increased risk of psoriatic arthritis and all the other things that I talked about. And it needs either ultraviolet light treatment or systemic therapy, and it needs to be continually controlled, in my opinion. 5 to 10% is a more tricky area because the better drugs aren't licensed for the treatment of this. We often start with topical therapies, but if they're not effective quickly, we will consider phototherapy or systemic therapy because we do need to make the skin better. Phototherapy, for those of you who are not aware of it, is ultraviolet light, it's artificial UVB. It's narrow band UVB. And in our hands at St. Vincent's, we'll clear the skin in 94% of people, we'll get it there. And often the remission is achieved six months as average, but we get some people who go into prolonged remission. There's limited access simply because you need to be close to a UVB unit and you need to come three times a week. And it's not worked out what the long-term skin cancer risk is, but there probably is if we give you too much of it, and there are safety limits that we don't go over. This is not sunbeds. Sunbeds produce high-dose UVA that's good at giving you a tan, and it's really good at giving you cancer. And it's really bad at treating psoriasis because it doesn't work very well. Not sunbeds. PUVA is another form of ultraviolet light it, where we use a photosensitizer called P. It's coincidentally called sarolin. There aren't many words that begin P-S-O-R in the English language, but we use sarolin to treat, with UVA to treat psoriasis. Long wave ultraviolet A, you have to come twice a week, really effective clearing people. And if we give you too much, we'll give you skin cancer, so we don't give you too much. There's a safety limit, and that limit is about 10 courses in your lifetime. And this is what these look like. For all the words, they look like stand-up sunbeds, but they're not. They produce a different form of light. The first line systemic treatment that we consider is methotrexate. It's weekly dosing. It's been around for 60 years. It works for arthritis. There are issues. It's highly teratogenic. So it's not suitable for a woman who's trying to plant in a family. It can cause liver problems, and we ask people to minimize their alcohol. It is associated, if you've got kidney problems, it can cause problems, occasional drug interactions, and it is actually cheaper than eating chips twice a week. It's about, costs you about 15 euro a month, depending where you buy your chips. But we do know that it's got a long-term safety record, and we've people in St. Vincent's who've been taking methotrexate for 45 years without side effects, and really good control of their skin, and good control of their joints. There's another medication called neotigason or acetretin, it is effective, but modestly, it's not suitable for women of childbearing age because it's highly teratogenic, but it can help. And I'm really presenting this just to show you that there are drug treatments that work and that are safe. We use fumaric acid ester as another oral treatment. Works in about 60% of people. We've got a good long-term record in terms of safety and efficacy, but it is a mild immunosuppressant and it can cause issues with the kidneys. But again, once these things are managed and managed appropriately, these work and can look after your skin in a long-term way. Premalast is the newest oral agent to the market. It's got modest efficacy, maybe similar to methotrexate. It's quite expensive compared to methotrexate. It's also useful in psoriatic arthritis. About one in 10 people get severe diarrhea and have to stop. And it's great joy, uh, even though we don't use too much of it because of its expense, is 10% of people lose 10% of their body weight. So in the United States, where they advertise drugs directly to market, and whenever I'm in the States, I'm always fascinated by the skin ads. And if you've ever seen them, they show these beautiful people with wonderful skin playing volleyball on beaches. Uh, and they, you know, they're selling you a lifestyle. They're not just selling you a psoriasis treatment. And normally, they whispered the side effects at the end can cause the, the, the boom. This one, they said, and 10% of people lost 10% of their body weight. And there were people ringing dermatologists looking for this drug. But we now have these oral treatments work well. When they work well for people, they have good long-term safety records. But we now have specific biologics that target bits of the immune system that's overactive in the skin that work really very, very well. And they're indicated for people for more severe disease. And this is the slide I had when I gave this talk 10 years ago, and we had four biologics that were available. Fliximab, Etanercept, and Adalimumab, they're grouped together as anti-TNFs, for those of you who are interested. And this was new 
on the market, relatively speaking. We'd had it for four or five years, and we were excited by it because it was clearing a lot of people and maintaining their skin very well. The wonderful thing is, since then, we've got a whole heap more. Actually, some of those haven't projected, my apologies. Oh, they do. So they're the older ones, and now these are the newer ones. So since then, we've had another six, and we're due to get another few more. And most of these are available in Ireland for the treatment of moderate to severe disease. And this is the list. We also have biosimilar versions of two of them, and one of them will become biosimilar. Biosimilar essentially means cheaper. Uh, and again, this means there should be more access for patients to get effective care. The only one that isn't reimbursed in Ireland at the moment is Bimikizumab, and that's been available in Northern Ireland and the UK and the rest of Europe for about a year and a bit. We have all of these options, all of which work very well. And I can say to you in 2023 that people with severe psoriasis should not have to live like this anymore. For the vast majority of people, we have got effective treatment with manageable side effects so that they don't have to live awful lives with this disease. And basically, for the majority of people, these work. And when they work, they continue to work. And these are just graphs showing you how well they work. And I won't get into the details of these in too much. But this is all of the ones that are licensed in clinical trials. Since the older ones, Ostekidumab or Stellara, some of you may be familiar, the newer agents actually work even better. And a PASI 90 response, if you're not familiar with it, means 90% of your psoriasis is gone. So you start with really severe disease, and you end up with a few patches. And in almost half of the people, modern drugs, they'll have no, people will have no psoriasis. None at all that we can find. So they start off with really severe disease, like the photographs I showed you. And after 16 weeks, and in long-term studies in this one, out to a year, we can't find any psoriasis. That's to my, somebody who started in this 27, eight years ago, this is wow. And the next generation of biologics in head-to-head -head trials have been even better again. So we're looking at this study, nearly 85% of people have 90% of their psoriasis gone after 16 weeks, and they maintain that response in the majority of people. Part of the contribution that we've made in Ireland to these, as well as participating in clinical trials, is that we've part, been part of the British and Irish long-term registry for psoriasis. And some of you in this room may have been given your information to this. This is anonymized, where we're looking to see the long-term efficacy and side effects in large numbers of people who've got psoriasis. And to date, between Ireland and the UK, there are 20,000 people. So all of that information is then used to see how well do people do in these drugs? Do they get rare side effects? And to date, less than 1% of people on biologics gets a significant side effect. And secondly, how can we make these treatments better? We know we've got highly effective treatments. Can we combine them? Can we reduce the dose in those people who are doing well? Will this reduce the risk of getting cardiovascular disease and arthritis in the long term? So more and more knowledge is being gained about this disease so that in the next few years, or if I'm asked back in 10 years, we may have even better stories than we have today. And these are the centers in Ireland and the UK that contribute to this database. So I hope I've shared with you, not everybody's the same. Psoriasis is about your individual need. It's about how much psoriasis affects your day-to-day -day life. What do you do? What would you like to do that your skin stops you from doing? What are your medical issues? Are they associated with psoriasis, and how do we manage these better? Do you have arthritis, and how can we prevent you from getting arthritis if that's feasible? If you lose weight and if you manage to stop smoking, there are two of the things. But part of this is your genetic makeup, and there isn't a lot that you can do about it apart from getting good treatment and managing your health to the best of your ability. So this obviously is not just about cream and a dermatologist anymore. This involves rheumatology, and Carl Orr is here today, cardiovascular management, gastroenterology management, obesity management, and psychology. But if we do this, if we detect these comorbidities early and intervene, it's my hope that we lead people to live normal, healthy lives as opposed to having severe disease and having the psychological consequences and suffering more of the significant illnesses that can be associated with this disease. Thank you very much for your time.